Exactly what I wanted to do. So I wanted to open it up a little bit to uh, maybe uh, five or ten minutes of technical Q&A. Um, one of my observations is this is wireless tech feed field day, and we're at Cradle Point very, very good at 4G LTE. We have Wi-Fi capabilities in our products. But uh, when we, in terms of the business we're in with the enterprises, we can't just go in and say we're 4G. We're the best at 4G. And so part of what we've been doing today is walking you through the elements of what's important to a distributed enterprise uh, from the networking standpoint, the manageability standpoint, the security standpoint, etc. But I wanted to open it up and maybe ask some questions from you guys. Or you know, it's been six years since Cradle Point's been here, and uh, I just want to find out what is on your mind or what is um, surprising to you or areas that we can answer. And I want to invite Michael and David up here as well to. Uh, to be able to answer as deep as you want to go. So we start here then. Um, and, you know, it may sound silly, but I think one of the biggest challenge or one of the big challenges that we face as Wi-Fi engineers is people bringing in the, the bring your own network approach and it doing stupid things uh, like picking channel three in my enterprise environment, right? So, yep. um, I, and I know it sounds sort of silly and stupid and minuscule, but, um, you know, what sort of advances have we made or have you made or, or you know, pioneered on, on little things like like auto channel selection to play nice with the rest of my enterprise's wireless network. Um, yep. So I'm going to do uh, two things to answer that. One is I have two tabs up here. One is the tab of the Cradle Point router, and then one is the tab of our cloud-based controller. And so on the uh, on the router, if I go into the networking section and uh, in local networks where I would set up the Wi-Fi, and let me just pick the the two four. And let me make the screen highlighted there. Um, so in this case, the the name of the and if you guys are have been looking at the uh, what I've been radiating, you're seeing that I'm radiating Wi-Fi in each of these devices. And this is the um, this is the uh, SSID that I have open on the on the router that I'm using right now. Um, of course, we mask that password because once someone sees it like you, then you have my password. So uh, on the smart selection, uh, we have some algorithms. You can have the user selection, uh, random selection, uh, smart selection. And really, and then that selection is, do you do it once on boot up? Do you do it daily? Do you do it weekly? It's a, it's a pretty sam simple algorithm. I think your question, you said pioneering, but I think what we're trying to do are some of the adequate things that you need to do to at least have a shot. Can you restrict it to only choose between 1, 6, or 11 so that it doesn't choose 2, 3, Something stupid. 8, nine. Yeah. yeah, something stupid. <laughs> Michael, I'm going to... To force David. it yeah. to pick one of the standard non-overlapping channels. Yeah, so if you just finish it there. And the same thing with yeah. the 5 gigahertz, so it doesn't choose one of the channels that client devices don't typically support. Right, and we do locking. I mean, that's the focus. Normally, when you walk into a building, you're going to do a Wi-Fi survey. You're going to make sure what you're going to be able to pick. Hopefully, you're able to do that. That's what the smart selection is for, right? Okay. We're going to pick the best, least used amount Wi-Fi channel. But, it, but with so a 2.4, that doesn't Wi-Fi tell me whether or not it's going to pick, like Sam said, something stupid. Yeah. Like if it's going to pick two, like maybe that's what Cradle Point thinks is best, but then you're interfering with a couple of different channels. Or if you're running something like Channel Fly on your access yeah. points, and you're, <laughs> and it's picking up its own, it's determining its own channel. So smart selection, in my opinion, if the if the country code for this device was the United States, smart selection, would, I would hope, would mean that it picks between one, one six, six, or eleven. 11 period. That's what we focus on. Yes. Okay. But there, there's no granularity to choose that. Not unless you're manually selecting it. Yeah. I mean, the, what, what I see is, I mean, I love, I love the interface, love the cloud, cloud, yes, yes. But if you want to play an enterprise, your interface looks like it's a Soho router for the Wi-Fi. You've got all these things over on the route switch side, high end, you want to make it work. And here it's like, wait, my yeah. Linksys has this. I see, yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. What we've, uh, what we've tried to do from a UI perspective, uh, and this is again a preview of the UI that we're just re uh, releasing, is keep it um, very user friendly because the customer, the feedback we're getting from cus enterprise customers is that the usability, the ease of use, the simplicity is something that's very, very attractive to them uh, without having to do a lot of detailed configuration. So it is, um, we, our design objective is to have this user friendly interface. Um, but if, if the question, or if you're saying that we don't go into the detail that you would see on an enterprise Wi-Fi 
um, yeah, I mean, in terms it, of the if options. If you're going to offer Wi Fi and you're going to sell this into an enterprise, you have to play nice with us or we have to turn you off. This is like a halfway in between. It's like it's on, but I don't have control over the right nerd knobs. Right. Most of the time, we're turning it off. We're, you know, they have Wi-Fi controllers. You know, you walk into, they have Aruba or they have, you know, HP Now or whatever they're using. So, are your radios turned off by default when it powers up? It's on by, it's on by default for connectivity reasons that you may want to configure it. But through Enterprise Cloud Manager, through the templates, automatically when it boots up, it automatically goes out and looks for a configuration that I have already pre the setup for my devices. So that may be on, may be off. And a lot of times, uh, we're in client mode sometimes now. Like, hey, there we have this AP that's connected on this other circuit, or you know, A B Z. You know, we're we're tunneling through whoever we're connecting to, so we may have it on, but not beaconing, um, just you know, there for a client mode. So depending on how the Wi-Fi is being used. But for to be blunt, guys, um, Kent was kind of going around it. We are not focused on Wi-Fi, quite mm -hmm. honestly. We're focused on the 4G LTE and the network connectivity. There's a lot of players in the world doing full control that we're autonomous AP. So if, if yes, we could ask for one thing as wireless engineers just to choose one, six, or 11. Okay. Perfect. It, it's like a little thing. Yeah. Just and, and pick one we, of the three. Yeah. And not focus on Wi-Fi right now in terms of we have one access point. We're not, we're not 30 access points. Right. If they want an access point, they want one. They want to cover this room for their business right. or for a, a temporary location like this. It's not trying to coordinate 50,000 access points to serve a stadium. But on that point, though, let's say that one just isn't enough, and all I need is two. Then what do I do? <laughs> I've done it, of course, uh, quite a bit. But what do you do then? What do you recommend? I'd wire them, of course, and then hooking them up both autonomous, turn down the power a little bit um, on each of them, and run the building, depending on how close they are to Isn't it the case that some of your routers have um, PoE ports? Yes. So and in that case, you may want to get ubiquity or you know we're to bring up a couple other terms that may be autonomous APs that we're not controlling that yeah, pause configure. while we all laugh a little bit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so that <laughs> but you know a controller Whoa. based Wi-Fi system is what ultimately I'm going to recommend to a customer all right but I mean you, you don't have any um, partnerships or anything like you would say we recommend we have partnerships. I don't know if under NDA I can talk okay. about them. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but I, I could say our, our enterprise customers are really what drive. A lot of times they have already decided on their Wi-Fi provider based on customer analytics, uh, other capabilities, client data usage, things like that, um, heat mapping for location, in-store location. So, you know, for us, it's just making sure that we play well with those partners. Sure, and, and I'm, I'm going back to that one site that, you know, the cradle point is almost everything except it doesn't get the last 50 feet, so I have to add wireless. Boy, wouldn't it be nice if there was a, I don't know, maybe a little cradle point AP or hey, something. Hey, a repeater. To, yeah. Yeah, just <laughs> well, we, th th this is, a, it's a very good question, and uh, we're working on a solution right now. Okay. I, can, I can say we're not ignoring that one uh, because that's a very, it's an obvious customer question and um, we'll have something for that. Uh, what I do in my house is I, I have a cradle point because I have cr as many cradle point devices as I want. I, I put it in Wi-Fi bridge mode and uh, that's how I cover my house. Just get a cradle point router that doesn't have a modem in it because uh, that's the most expensive component. And, uh, and put it in Wi-Fi bridge mode. Uh, one thing I wanted to, and then I'll take another question, but one thing I wanted to show, this, I'm logged in directly to the router, uh, but the UI, if I go into Cloud Manager and I go find that router, which is this one right here, and I hit uh, Configuration Edit, this is the user interface that, uh, that I would bring up for that router, and it should look very familiar. We use the exact same code in our cloud manager that, uh, that we use on the router. And what this means is I can now uh, go through and configure uh, a population of 40,000 routers the same way that I would uh, my own individual router at home. Can you show, I don't know if it's possible to demo, but I'd love to see what a, a, you know, the, the first onboarding looks like when you take one out of the box. Can I set up in the cloud, I have, you know, 5,000 stores and I just want to mail them. Will they come up and phone home and grab the yep. config and everything? Yeah. Yeah, let me go through that real quick. So from Enterprise Cloud Manager, let's say your distribution center mails them to your company, blah, blah, blah. We'll have the distribution center that scanned all the units they picked, send us the list, and we'll pre-populate that list in Enterprise Cloud Manager. Then you can place them into your group template. So we have templates where you have the setup for your configurations and the firmware as well. 
And so when it gets turned on, the nice thing about cell, you just have to put a SIM in there. You don't have to go in there and static IP it, because that automatically comes through. Put the SIM, it gets online, and automatically gets this configuration, it's firmware. And this is a good way for managing that PCI compliance as well, and making sure it gets installed correctly, because it automatically gets that configuration you already pre-processed in the cloud. But, I mean, we're really aiming for zero touch deployment. I mean, typically, uh, one of the reasons managed service providers like us is that they can send a person on site to do the install that's less expensive than someone with the, the creds like CCI or something like that. So people who are <coughs> with setting up ladders, turning screwdrivers, running cables, and, uh, and that's part of our objective to keeping uh, those managed service providers happy. It makes the deployment process way faster than working with Lex and trying to get Wireline in there as well. Day one internet's really easy. A lot of customers use that. I was over the, yeah. Commentary for me, I guess, I, you know, I, I've used Cradle Point off and on over the years, and so seeing it sort of progress and some of the new features come out, I think it's kudos to you guys. I mean, it's made... We've used a lot for M&A activity, right? So people need, like, like in retail, it's like sort of a flash cut of a bunch of sites, so we'll go out and drop cradle points in, get those circuits up, VPN back, shut off everything else, and then get it wired in when we can get it. Um, so having all these extra features has been pretty useful. Um, so it's just good to see that that evolution's continuing and cloud management's making it easier. And so I like the interface and where you guys are heading. I think it's a good, Thank you. good step Appreciate in the right direction. Uh, from a, from, for Zscaler, is that right? Um, that's only for outbound, correct? So are you offering anything on inbound attacks or inbound? That would be the IPS IDS that we're running on the, the box itself. That's Rich running on Magra. the cradle point right now? Yes. Oh, nice. Yep. Yeah, so if I wanted to set that up, uh, I'm going to go through, well, I can do it through the cloud. Actually, I'll do it through here. So if I go into the uh, security section on the cradle point router, this is uh, uh, Basically, we've added zone firewall, so uh, we can define the zone, set up the policies for that. It's uh, this is our next generation firewall that we're launching. But if I wanted to do the uh, threat management, that's where I go to this router, and this is not turned on on this router because I just set it up. But this is this is the settings where you would go configure the Trend Micro engine. Do uh, you want to just detect only, detect and prevent? Uh, what do you want to do on failure? Uh, I always deny traffic, so I know that something's wrong. Do I want to log the application ID that's going through there? Uh, yes. And then uh, basically, since it is a paper use, I keep pointing to you because you're my paper use uh, questioner. Uh, we have a different update schedule for new signatures depending on whether you're on a, a modem WAN or a non modem WAN. So if you do have mixed environments where it's intermittently connected to a wired network, uh, like a vehicle pulling into the bus yard now attaches to the bus yard's access point and, and sees now it has a Wi-Fi as WAN connection. Uh, now I'm going to use that to download the signatures that I'm going to have on the school bus, you know, to prevent uh, tablets and smartphones from getting the, the malware. Yeah, and when it comes to these security applications, what we're doing is we're partnering with best and breed in the industry. Like Zscaler is a secure web gateway partner, Magic Quadrant leader, Trend Micro. They're, it's actually their engine and their signatures that are running on our box. So they're powering it. So they're the ones with 100 million endpoints around the world gathering those signatures, the, detecting those zero-day threats, and then they provide us those updates. We're not, we're not the security gurus behind that. Except for, I will say, do be detailed on your firewall rules. <laughs> yeah. You know, standard stuff. Any, any other questions in there? Yeah, there was a, um, as you were poking through, I think, one of the BGP screens, there was a licensed features tab. Do you have, like, a really coarse breakdown of, of how you guys do licensing of features? Is it like, I, I think we're all relatively sensitive to nickel and diming every yeah, last little thing out. I'm really, I'm really glad you asked that. The, the, I'm so happy. I've worked with a lot of companies in the past, right? Cisco and different, all the different iOSs and the licensing they have. We have Enterprise Cloud Manager, which manages all the licenses to the devices. We have Standard, and then you have Prime. And Prime includes all the licenses that enable all the features like BGP, VRP, advanced routing features, et cetera, et cetera, in the router. So that's either on or off. Now, the services like threat management through and Zscaler, those are separate. Okay. Yeah. So, because we're, we're working, we're partnering with those companies for services as well through us, so we have to work with them. But for everything else in the OS of the router or firmware, we like to call it, is enabled it's by one, one license. One license. And, and typically, that's where, if there's a COGS involved, where it's, it's something that we're not loading into every single device. 
uh, that's that's where we it's a it's a different business model. It's it's more of where we're integrating with someone and, and sharing revenue from that. Sure. I was just looking for our entitlements management page. Um, uh, I was going to show you where we'd add that. I'm not going to take the time now, but I was going to go add Trend Micro to this router, um, and we do that through a, a portal on our website for managing entitlements. Mm -hmm. All right, and I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit about our hardware before I go into the closing vignette here. And I'll, I'll start with this core IBR 600 here. This is our, our workhorse. This is what put Cradle Point on the LTE map. And right here, that you're looking at the best-selling enterprise-grade LTE router in the history of LTE networking. This has sold more units, has more LTE activations than any other product in the world for an enterprise-grade router. Um, it's got... Uh, it, and one of the reasons why it was because it's first to market, and the other reason is it's a very, very versatile device. It's small. It's got two, two Ethernet ports, WAN LAN switch bomb, both of them. The integrated LTE connection, these uh, modem antennas uh, that, that work across all the bands. The, it's got uh, all the advanced routing, OSPF, BGP, RIP, STB, VRP, the whole works, all the gamut we've got on it, basic fire, the, the, or the firewalling we have on our routers. Now, it's not going to hit gigabit speeds, but for the applications where this is going, kiosk, digital signage, ATM, uh, in, inside of businesses, this can pretty much do everything to to 30 megabits per second, maybe. GPS um, built into that one? Yeah, GP GPS as well on the auxiliary port. It doesn't have a dedicated active GPS antenna port, but this has been a very, very popular product, and it goes in all the applications there are. It goes into the retail stores, the kiosks, and a lot of people put into vehicles. So we took this great best-selling product, and then we said, how do we make this better specifically for vehicles? And that's when we came out with this core IBR 1100. It takes all the best features out of that and then puts it in a ruggedized form factor specifically designed for vehicles. So when it's, that, that has Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi versions, single band 2.4, this is dual band, dual concurrent with AC technology, uh, three gigabit Ethernet ports, cause, or three, three Ethernet ports, 10100, because one is always more because they, they always want one more. Um, uh, it's got the active GPS built in it, so if you want to put it on a vehicle and track your vehicle while it's driving around, you hook up this antenna, wire it out, and you've got active uh, GPS reporting of tape, NEMA sentences, sent to multiple servers, so you know your ambulance, you, if, you're, if it's an ambulance, you can send it to the ambulance company, you can send it to the hospital, and then you can send it to your service provider simultaneously, as well as to a local server, all at different reporting intervals, so you know where it is. So if you're driving down the freeway, send it every 10 seconds. If you're sitting in a parking lot, send it once every half hour, so you're not chewing up all your data. What was the model in that one? This is the IBR 1100. It's also got all the... Uh, uh, surge protection uh, and, and voltage filtering built in. It's 90 to 36 volts instead of 9 to 18. When you, when you turn on the vehicle, the voltage spikes, drops. You can wire this directly into the fuse box of the, the, the bus and it's not going to fry this device. That guy, we had a few of them get got fried. So we needed DC to DC converters and inductors. This guy has it all built in. Also ignition sensing. So when you turn it on, vehicle, it automatically boots up. When you turn it off, it'll automatically shut off after a user-defined delay. And it's so, also, yeah. and, and from from the connectivity perspective, single single carrier, dual carrier. So this has got a single carrier on it. Uh, later this or, or next month, we're launching the dual carrier version, where you've got this product as is, and we add a dock to add a second modem. But this right here, and then you've got two two carriers simultaneously with load balancing, failover. Uh, is there the available. ability on that one to connect to a Wi-Fi network on one side and? And not dual carrier, but kind of dual carrier. One Absolutely, Wi -Fi. it's it's a, all of our products that have Wi-Fi support Wi-Fi as WAN. Huge use case in vehicles. You're driving around, capturing all this data, live video on those on the on those on a lot of those buses in the municipalities. And they'll have up to 20 high def cameras, and they're recording all that video, and they don't want to upload that over the 4G network. So what they do is they drive into their bus station. We automatically connect to Wi-Fi as WAN using WPA2 enterprise authentication, upload all of that video, and then when they drive, 20 minutes later when they drive out of the bus full of gas, all that video is on their, their main server. Also on the on the LTE connections, we can carry your switch to any carrier. Yeah. So it's it, really important. So if you get a really big county over on this side of the county, like in Washington, some places, mm -hmm. it's Verizon. And this side of the county is AT&T. You know, they split it off so they can se separate it out and push out different firmware for different carriers. Stealing my thunder. I'm building up to that one right there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Oliver, we, we were the, also the first in the industry to implement what we call multi-carrier software-defined radios. This one piece of hardware supports all of the carriers through a software load. And, oh. and it also has dual SIM slots, so you can do it remotely. <coughs> so you have AT&T and Verizon in this. You deploy it. As Verizon, one year later, you want to change it, call up AT&T, activate my SIM, press a button in ECM, and then you're live on the other carrier. And then you can it, slap the, con the unit on the bottom so that you can support two carriers at once. Mm -hmm. Yep, two Verizon carriers at once, all multi-carrier software-defined radios. Okay. And so with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into the, uh, the conclusion here. Quick, uh, quick yeah, question yeah. again on that, and, and I know it might be a weird question, but um, meshing capabilities on those to, to mesh with 
other buses, other vehicles that are nearby? Just on the Wi-Fi side. So that well, Wi-Fi. But on the Wi-Fi side, is yeah, supported. We could connect to another one, absolutely. Okay. And prioritize and load balance, or however we want to do that. Okay. So I've got a Troy unit pulls up. It's got an active connection to the internet in some way, shape, or form, 4G or whatnot. Another patrol unit pulls up. It can use that yeah. patrol unit as a bridge to the to the network. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yep. We did. we have just post. making sure. I had to clarify a little. All bit. right. So yeah, so uh, in inclusion here uh, for the for the last little uh, juggling, yeah, the stakes are raised. The real world consequences if you mess up. People are people are choosing routers and uh, 4G solutions to get their networks online. If they fail, I mean, it can affect companies, bottom lines, jobs, economies, and so uh, to represent that real world consequence to, for the conclusion, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt for the end here to juggle these flaming three. Yeah. Whoa. Holy moly. Whoa. There you go. 14 inch blades. Uh, I'll, I'll set those right here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I, I will actually before, have you huh? move. Because again, if I drop these or mess up, it's representation of me juggling, not quite a point. Uh, that disclosure here. But it's, it's about these real world consequences, but you, you got to prove it. Uh, you have to actually perform in the field. Uh, when you're doing this, and so uh, when when our when we get into a bake off with our competitor, our VP of sales absolutely loves it because okay, they're baking us off against our competition. That means they've got us in house. We have a phenomenally high close rate on that. So when we get to that point, our VP of sales is we're going to win this deal, um, uh, and uh, and it's and it has to do with being the leaders in 4G LTE. Maintaining that leadership position, we were the first to come out with LTE support, first on USB modems, then the embedded modems, then with Ryzen came out with XLTE, and you keep keeping up with uh, the technology. And we run into customers who are like, oh, we tried cellular, it doesn't work. It's like, well, have you tried Cradle Point? And there's just no. We, we stuck a USB modem into some router, and when we had an outage on the landline connection, it didn't work. And well, of course it didn't work because you didn't have analytics, you couldn't update the firmware. Uh, somebody actually walked off with a stick and charged, racked up a $2,000 overcharge because it's a theft target. You've got all these problems. Uh, Cradle Point, we, we built our business off of making these USB modems suck less. We were 100% based on, our, our company was 100%, you plug in a USB modem and uh, make a hotspot out of it. We made these suck less than anybody else in the industry. And so enterprises started using them. They're like, no, we're going to move to an enterprise grade modem with enterprise grade support and now we can keep that VPN tunnel up reliable and continue to go. So you, you've got you to prove it out there in the field. And so that's what we, uh, we do is prove it. Woo! Anybody want some watermelon? Watermelon anyone? Peter Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Nope, I dropped one. I got it. All righty. So um, that's hunters. real. So throw no, it in your real. mouth. That's not exactly uh, entirely, I'll just leave these right here, an entirely fair comparison. Because once, once you um, have, have proved that you've got a solution that works in the field today, what about in two years? The network topology is changing, the infrastructure is uh, being upgraded. You've got to have a new firmware come out, zero day threats come out. You've got to be able to upgrade that solution. So it's kind of an unstable infrastructure that you're working on. And so to represent that unstable infrastructure right here is what I've got. It's got a contraption called a roll of bola, oh. which I'm going to set right here. Board on the ground. On top of that, I place a four inch PVC pipe. And top of this, I will attempt to stand while attempt juggling these three 14 inch blades. And I will have you move. If that's all right. <laughs> I, have, I have confidence, but uh, not that much, unfortunately. Um, Scott, I need a longer XLR cable. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, you guys can move to another round. <laughs> Hold on. Let me get this out of the way. <laughs> so, by the looks on some of your faces, some of you actually think I'm going to do this. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Not like this. I, uh, I have a day job here at Creative Point. I'm a product manager. I learned you've always got to have a backup plan. Be safe. Always have a backup plan with failover by Creative Point. Represented by the helmet. Always be safe. <laughs> always wear a helmet. And so now, for the grand finale here, representing the challenge Cradle Point has faced, proving it to our customers time and time again, uh, on an unstable infrastructure with upgraded environment. We don't just have a point product with LTE, we have the entire solution, from M to M, to enterprise grade, to businesses, and, uh, and, and we don't just have a, a lot of our competitors come out, hey, we put 4G in a product, it's the one you need now, that's not good enough. Uh, that one, one carrier covers 80% of deployment, what about the rest of your deployments? And when they upgrade the new technology, we've done over 65 certifications on LTE networks in the last year alone. Uh, and so to represent that challenge here, I've got this. Whew. All right, folks. Double spin. No spin. <laughs> Behind the back. Whoa. Hey. And 
And finally, what Credo Point's doing out in the market right now is attacking. Hiya! 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 Woo! <laughs> You're nuts, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. So clearly you drove down from Boise. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, just to close, um, I think one of the things that's fueling our growth, and I'm, I'm moving from the, uh, the technical to the marketing side, is our belief, and uh, the X shadow is showing it, our belief is that uh, <laughs> if you look at the growth of spend in LAN and WAN, it's clipping along at a normal pace. But what we're seeing, and this is proven by customers that we have, as well as uh, from our competitors, is that the share of, uh, of the, the mobile, the 3G and 4G component of this LAN WAN spend is, is growing. And uh, it's growing much faster than just the overall growth of the land land spend. And I think in terms of uh, just kind of wrapping up what is really our strength is we live in these two worlds. I mean, if you look at a competitive environment, we have this side on the left side, which is traditional enterprise networking. And a lot of what you heard us talking about is the things, again, that we have to do very well to be able to play in the enterprise space around security, advanced networking, cloud-based management. But then on the M2M &M and the IoT space, and there's a lot of uh, purpose-built routers in that space, uh, to be able to do well in that world, uh, this is where we're able to bring all of that enterprise and, frankly, our Wi-Fi, which I think is, is a pretty good Wi-Fi. It's not stadium Wi-Fi. It's not Walmart Wi-Fi, but it's school bus Wi-Fi. It might be the lobby of a jack-in-the-box. That kind of Wi-Fi, we're able to bring that over into that m to IoT space. And uh, bringing the IoT and our other capabilities over the enterprise, that's, that's where we're winning. And it's really that, uh, the growth there. And I think one of the things I'll, I'll just do to close is, um, is just introduce or talk about some of the team that we've put together. Um, so our CEO, George Mulhern, used to run HP's worldwide laser jet printer business. Uh, he was retired. He was working at a v, uh, VC uh, in, in Idaho, and we made the change and, uh, and did that. Our CMO, uh, Ian Pinnell, you, uh, some of you may know him, was retired from Cisco. He was there for 17 years. He ran Cisco's branch router business, SVP general manager. Um, our CTO, Ryan Alfin, uh, was at McAfee for 13 years. He was, they were acquired by Intel, and so he ran one of Intel's four uh, security business units. So I guess the, the message I'm saying is we've built a very, very different company than what we brought here uh, six years ago. It's, it's an enterprise company with skill sets from a lot of different areas. Uh, we have a great team, great product, and we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it today.